this is a strange phenomenon for me because usually when I talk to crowds, I have uh, slides behind me on a screen and uh, I know what I'm talking about. It's my data. I've been doing it for a long time and I know more than everyone else. This is different. I'm not going to talk about my science today. I'm instead going to talk about a phenomenon I've observed while the, during the course of everything Jay just said from different vantage points. So think of me today instead of as a radiation oncologist and whatever else he mentioned, instead as a long-range scout out searching the world of biology and reporting back to you guys the vanguard of the host of good marching against, in my case, cancer. And I'm going to tell you what I've seen and what I think is limiting us in our biological and biomedical uh, world to the marginal successes we've had and I think we'll continue to have if we don't change. So it starts out, like uh, Dr. Collins said, in a high school classroom where my teacher Bob Schertz taught me that the human mind can understand anything with enough creativity, hard work, some mathematics. Um, and that love of physics has guided a lot of what I've done. And uh, I have a strong family tradition of military service, and so I went to the Naval Academy after that and chose astrophysics, as, uh, as Jay told you. But when I got there, I was studying astrophysics, and it's beautiful, the stars are there, the planets are aligned, everything's great. There's a lot of fun stuff to do at the Academy, but I started to get more and more disconnected from the length scales of the thing. So it was hard to understand why I should care about uh, star that has a mass of 10 to the 30th kilograms and is 10 to the 20th meters away when my classmates and I were all preparing for the very real possibility of war. Um, and I started sort of becoming more in tune to this length scale, sort of about 10 to the zeroth meters and maybe 10 to the second kilograms. And it started to call to me to sort of bring my um, minimal intellect to bear on that, that problem. But the problem was also was calling was Uncle Sam and he wanted me to go to a nuclear submarine. And when he calls, you don't say, hey, I've got another idea. You say, uh, sir. So I went aboard the USS Louisiana, which at the time was the newest ship in our Navy, or boat as we call them as a submariner. Um, a nuclear submarine is possibly the most fascinating device man's ever created. From the intellect of one man, basically, Hyman Rickover, came this idea that we could build a 400-foot tube, put it under the ocean, put a nuclear reactor inside it, and make steam and sea power and basically um, safety for all of us. But uh, the issues there are that you don't really want to have any of the people on board the, the submarine being creative. You have the creativity to make the thing, <laughs> but you, you don't really want me at 23 sort of fiddling around while you're on alert. And so, you guys can understand that. So when my naval service was over, I sort of remembered that call and I thought to myself, you know, maybe I should do something about this human condition that I'm so curious about. So I applied to medical school, and after some time it takes to get in, I had to take some more classes. I ended up going to Case Western. Uh, in the interim, there was a gap year where I went back and taught high school physics while I was waiting to start classes, and I coached some wrestling. And it was really an important year for me because it really rejuvenated my energy and gave me a lot more vim and vigor to go into my medical training with because my students were so brave and open and creative. And so, as I got to med school, I, I mean, I'm going to tell you, I loved it. It was the most fun I've ever had. It was like a backstage pass to everything cool about being a human being. Um, I spent my summers breaking human limbs, like cadaver limbs, mind you, with robots. Uh, I got to talk to world leaders in every field. And when you're a med student, all you have to do is look curious and confused, and people show you everything they've ever done that's cool. <laughs> it's, it's the best time. I would go back in a heartbeat, um, except for the debt load. So, and then you also get to participate in every part of the human condition. You see joy and anguish, uh, you see birth and you see death, and it's just so unbelievably humbling. And so I was really torn in finishing up medical school. What sort of specialty should I do? Everything was amazing, everything was beautiful. Um, and really, I couldn't figure it out because it was all so cool. And so one day, I was just accidentally looking for radiology, actually, and I ended up in the basement standing next to this linear accelerator with a bunch of engineers and physicists who I feel very at home with, <laughs> very nerdy. And we were all standing around talking about how to, how to do best for this one patient. And it really felt good to be part of a team of really smart, uh, excited people working on a, a common goal of cancer. So I picked, and I went with radiation oncology. My wife and I had our first child during internship. Um, and so we moved down to Tampa and I started at the Moffitt Cancer Center studying radiation oncology. As soon as I got there, I started looking around, and, and just for everyone to know, cancer is a wonderful evidence-based field. We really do a good job of reading the studies and converting the, the practice. 
But the problem there for me is that, again, the creativity issue comes in. You don't want to be creative except in palliative situations. You want to do the right thing. And I believe in evidence-based medicine, it's true. So I started looking around for opportunities for research. And I got lucky, and I found this group called the Integrative Mathematical Oncology, run by a gentleman named Sandy Anderson, who's one of my supervisors now, who is really within the Cancer Center. And they're a group of mathematicians and physicists who are funded by the NCI's new initiative called uh, Physical Sciences and Oncology Centers, which is designed to do just this, bring non-biological thinkers to the fray to get some different types of thinking. And I got really excited. This is something that seemed like it was a perfect fit for me. And so, and I really fell into this niche. I wasn't able to do the research they were doing. I can't write a computer program to save my life. And I used to be good at math when I was in high school and college, but it's been a long time. And there's now a lot of anatomy that's moved a lot of that out of the way. And so, but what I was able to do is I was able to bring questions to them and translate stuff for them. And so it was really a nice uh, niche that I just found. And so I was sort of finding this rise again. I was doing really well, I was publishing research. And staying up at night, reading, spending my free time as a new dad with this group. And so I decided to do what any sensible person would be, do, to put the brakes on everything and start over again, again. And so I got the patronage of my chairman, Craig Stevens, and Bob Gatenby, and they said, yeah, you can take some time off residency, and you can go on over to Oxford. And so now I'm living in Oxford, England, and I'm studying math, and I'm a novice all over again, all the way at the bottom. My colleagues are 22, and nobody called me Dr. Scott except my mom. Um, <laughs> So, so, what about, so that's my story. So, so what have I learned? What's the point of me standing here in front of this audience telling you where I've been? So it's, you know, it's been fun and I haven't gotten a real job yet, but what, <laughs> what, can, I, what can I offer to you? And, and I'm going to tell you, especially because you guys are my future colleagues, bosses, grant reviewers, current bosses, grant reviewers. What am I going to tell you? So I'll tell you what, what, what I think is important. I've discovered that biology is different than other sciences. Now you're saying, okay, it took you all that time to figure that out. <laughs> what I, but I want to stress is that biology has changed fundamentally in the last 15 years, and we have not changed the way we approach biology. So there's been a technological explosion um, that's been driving a huge boom of knowledge in biomedicine. Uh, and nobody, if you took a, a master of a field 10 years ago, and you showed the amount of knowledge they had, you take that same field, that same tiny subfield, and look at all the technology and, and measurements we've done, and it's 100 times the size, that same knowledge set. So it's almost like a new corollary of Moore's Law, like we were talking about with Dr. Collins. As we've massively increased every subset of knowledge, in order to be an expert now, you have to fractionally understand less and less of it, because you can't possibly know everything. And so what's happening is that all of the experts are getting so deeply partitioned and disconnected and pigeonholed just to, in order to master the same amount of material that they used to. And then in some senses, that's good. But in a lot of senses, it's scary because it's caused a, a disconnectedness that we've never seen before. And every time we measure a new thing, we push our knowledge out linearly. But the complexity of the entire picture gets multiplied and becomes a geometric expansion. And so really, it's sort of like R and R squared. And we're, fa we're really falling behind this curve. And this also sort of calls into question the whole cartoon model of mechanism des description. I think now that we have dynamic data, we need dynamic models, um, typically born in the ma ma uh, language of mathematics, in order to understand this. We can no longer take our phenomena and try to cram them into the crystalline spheres and make sure they rotate around the Earth. It's not going to work. And so th this evolution that bio biology has gone through just recently is fundamentally different than other scientific disciplines in which theory and experiment and theory and experiment walk hand in hand. What we're, and biology used to be that way, but what we're seeing now is that experiment and technology, experiment and technology are shepherding themselves forward, and theory's gotten left immensely behind, 30 years behind. Excuse me, behind. And so this disconnectedness is what really scares me. And it's what's allowed my successes, because as a, that's, that's the niche I fit in, is sort of bringing people out of these silos. But there's not a lot of people who have done all the silly things I've done, and I would argue that no one really wants to do that. So how can we change our methods? How can we recruit people to do something along the lines of where I am? A, there's no rewards in place. I'm usually the middle author on papers because I'm not doing the work and I'm not the guy at the end of the silo. Someday I will be, I hope. So, so where can we get connectors like this? We can't ask the specialists to do it because that would pull them out of the niche, and we need them in the niche because otherwise there's no point to all of this. And so I submit, for biomedical science at least, the, the perfect candidate for this is an MD-trained scientist. 
Um, the training you get at medical school is exactly the connecting phenomenon that we need. You think about a complex patient with all these symptoms that are seemingly disconnected. My, my belly hurts and my leg hurts and this hurts and that hurts, and we look for a unifying diagnosis. That's exactly what we need going forward to team with the scientists who are deep down. So that's an easy solution. MDs should be scientists. Why, aren't, why isn't this just happening all over? What's standing in the way? What's standing in the way of or, excuse me, physicians who are curious enough to walk over to the Department of Mathematics and say, hey, what are you doing? And maybe walk into a lab and try to connect those two people. What's keeping doctors from trusting in silico results on a computer instead of in vitro and in vivo results? What's uh, stopping us from understanding that information theory might help us with genetics, or that uh, invasive pest ecology might help us with invasive tumors, or that thermodynamics might help us with mitochondrial display or uh, dysregulation? And I'm going to submit that the, the number one thing that's causing this problem is the way we select and reward medical students. Going through medical school is amazing, but to get there, to get into this club, you have to have a perfect resume across the board. GPAs and MCAT scores, and since I've been in high school, have gone up by a whole standard deviation. You need an average of 3.7 to get into medical school now, and an average MCAT of 31. This is like shock treatment for wrong answers and for failure. You can't, you can't do anything. You can't take any risks. You have, to take, you have to get an A in every class you take. You can't take anything fun or out, sort of outlandish or off topic. Otherwise, you won't get into the club. And then you got $250,000 worth of debt and no job. Congratulations. That's sort of where I am. Um, <laughs> so, so what I'm not saying here is that the people that we've selected currently are incapable of doing this job. What I am saying is we've been asking them to do the wrong thing for a long time, to use the wrong parts of their brain. The part of the mind that's responsible for every single transformative leap in all of science ever is the imagination and creativity. And what we've done is we've taken that part of the brain and thrown it to the side and put a warehouse in its place. And we ask medical students to fill that warehouse with the names of genetic mutations, biochemical pathway cartoon pictures, um, drug names, whatever you like. That, you know what, physicians 20 years ago didn't have to remember. And so how often have you heard your favorite professor say, Jake, well, he probably wouldn't say it to you, but Jake, if I had to apply to medical school today, I'd never get in. I've heard it 50 times, at least, and I think I've even said it nowadays. But the point is, is that these are like mid-career academic physicians that are the best of the best. If they couldn't get into med school, you know, what is it they have that makes them so successful now? And what it, what it is that we're weeding out is that creative solutions, those dot connecting. Because before, there wasn't as much certainty in science, so there had to be a bit more art. And now we're sort of we think that there's all this extra certainty, so we should just memorize the certainty and go forward. But I'm going to suggest that we, we can't do that. We can't do all of it. We can't be the complete expert on every field and still connect outlandish thoughts to new things. And I think if we don't keep doing this, we're going to end up having the same marginal successes. So I'm going to put out a call to arms to medical students. Step outside of your busy clinical routine. Step away from your textbooks. Dial back the focus of your microscope. Try desperately to remember the science that you were passionate about before you started preparing for the MCAT. And get out of your comfort zone. All these things are going to take time and energy, and they're going to be hard to do. And I know how, hard, how nice it is to feel like you've become an expert at something after seven years. But starting over is critical. You have to embrace this new role, because only the broad generalist is going to be able to connect these things. And if you dedicate all your time drilling down one hole, you can't possibly have this new role. So many MD scientists are cousins, as I was. Jake, pick a specialty, go all the way, know everything. Well, that's what a PhDs do. We can't do both. There's no reason to do both. And I think going forward in science, if we keep, continue to summarily rip the creativity and ability and desire to have creative solutions that might fail from our MD students, we're never going to have the new player come into the game and never going to move forward except in marginal steps, which I'm arguing are, are not steps at all. So, you know, I've been... I've been all over the map in my career, and I've seen amazing technology. Nuclear submarines hundreds of feet underwater with missiles that go into outer space and land within a few feet on Earth. Whoa. High energy linear accelerators that can treat brain tumors within a millimeter. But everywhere I've been, the most impressive technology is always the three pounds of jello that we're all carrying around in our heads. But we are, like I said, summarily destroying the ability of that three pounds of jello, the magic part, if you will that we don't know anything about. We're taking it from the scientists of the future, and we have to absolutely stop that. Um, thanks.